It's my pleasure to introduce, we'll start here with Verlin Lewis. He's the Sterling Professor of Constitutional Studies here at Utah Valley University. And he's also the author of The Myth of Left and Right, which was just published this year. It's a brand new book that will be very relevant to what we're talking about today. And also Derek Monson, he's the Chief Growth Officer for us at Southern Institute. He manages the policy team and has done a lot of work and writing on polarization as well. So Verlin and Derek, thanks so much for talking with us this morning. So I, I want to start out, it's the, the context that Congressman Curtis laid, I think is very helpful for our conversation, where both of you with your respective areas of expertise and, and your work history, working on policy issues, on constitutional issues, and thinking of it through the lens of polarization, I, I want to start out by kind of asking you both a general question. Can you paint a picture today, if you had to describe how polarization is today? What sort of paint the picture? How do you define it? It's, it's not just about disagreeing. It's got to be something different than that because we've had disagreement throughout the history of the entire country. How do you define polarization and how would you characterize its presence today in our politics and in public life? Sure. All right. So I just want to start by saying thank you to the Sutherland Institute for organizing uh, this wonderful event today. I've been a longtime fan of the Sutherland Institute and what you all do there. Um, mostly because I've noticed the Sutherland Institute is committed to constitutional government. It's something, of course, near and dear to my heart, um, working at the Center for Constitutional Studies here at UVU. And I, I just might begin by saying I was in um, complete agreement with everything that I heard from Representative Curtis. And I think he was giving us good um, advice about how we should change our behavior and that elected officials really are uh, a reflection of voters. Um, I would just say in response to what he was saying there, um, the only problem with what he was saying is probably nothing's going to change, right? If everyone who came into this room today leaves this room today with the same mental model of politics, right? They leave with the same mental model of politics that they came in with then they will not change their behavior. I can stand up next to Representative Curtis and say everything he said, and I agree with it. Turn off cable news. Don't watch Fox News. Don't watch MSNBC. Delete your Instagram account. All right, delete your Twitter account. I agree with all of that. I think it's good. I would encourage you. But if you came in addicted to political outrage today, right? if you came in addicted to doing these things, it's like telling an alcoholic, Oh, just use your willpower. Stop drinking alcohol. Nothing's going to change until you rewire their brain. They've got to go to rehab, right? They've got to they've got to go through therapy. They've got to change the way they think about their life. The same thing about politics. We can tell people um, to stop being tribal lemmings. We can tell people to stop being awful to each other. We can tell people to stop screaming at their neighbors. They will not change until they change the way they think about politics. So that's, that's everything that I'm going to be talking about today. I apologize. I'm a hammer who sees everything as a nail, but that's, that's my number one uh, crusade right now. I don't think we can do anything more important for constitutional government in the United States today than changing the way we think about politics because we're all thinking and talk, talking about politics all wrong. Okay, let me, having put that off the table, let's talk about polarization. Political scientists talk about polarization in two ways. Uh, they, they talk about ideological polarization and affective polarization. Ideological polarization is this idea that the parties have moved to these extremes of left and right, and they've taken more extreme issue positions. I think that's utterly false. Do Democrats, right, if, if being in favor of free speech was once upon a time a democratic political position, are they more in favor of free speech than they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 50 years ago? No, not even close. Actually, the opposite. Republicans once upon a time were thought that, oh, Republicans want to cut government spending. That's what Republicans are about. Have they moved to the extreme anti-government position? No, not even close. Over the last 30, 40 years, they've only increased government spending and government debt, right? The ideological uh, polarization idea is just absolutely false. Okay, what's the other kind of polarization political scientists talk about? Affective polarization. This is the idea that people have become more angry toward each other, more hostile toward each other, they hate each other more. That is absolutely true. 
all the survey data shows that very clearly people hate each other much more in terms of people from a different political party than they did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever you want to look at. That's absolutely true. Now, my uh, intervention today and my, um, what I'll be trying to argue is that we actually probably shouldn't be using the term polarization because it assumes that there are two poles on a unidimensional political spectrum that I think don't, doesn't exist. And by using the term polarization, we're actually reifying the myth that there's only one issue in politics, there's a unidimensional spectrum, and that um, all the issue positions that currently fly under the banner of the Republican Party are bound together by a unifying philosophy, and all of the issue positions that currently fly under the banner of the Democratic Party fly under a common philosophy. I think that's a myth, and I think by using the, the language polarization, we're actually entrenching it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're causing people to start thinking about politics in that way, and then they say, well, yeah, if there is only two philosophies in the world, conservatism and progressivism, and I have the correct philosophy, and the other party has the wrong philosophy, that means I'm right about everything. Imagine that, omniscience. All 8,000 political positions, you have the correct position. Isn't that amazing? Wow, congratulations. And the person in the other political party, they're wrong about everything. They're not wrong about a few things. They're not you prefer this party because they have more of the stuff you like than the other party. No, they're wrong about everything. Well, if that was really the case, if that's the way you view politics, a unidimensional spectrum, and just all you have to do is sign up for the correct side, then yeah, I wouldn't want to be neighbors with that person either. They're wrong about everything. And I wouldn't want my kids to go to school with that person's kids because they're wrong about everything. And I wouldn't want to go to church with that person because they're wrong about everything. And I wouldn't want to even have a conversation on the street with that person. They're wrong about everything. If that's the way you view the world, if that's the way you came in today, you're going to leave that. You're going to keep watching Fox News. You're going to keep watching MSNBC. You're going to keep going on social media. You're going to keep being horrible to your neighbors. And if you're not, then that's a credit to your character. But you'd be a lot better off if you gave up that view of politics. So that's my view about polarization. Thank you, Verlin. Derek, how, how would you characterize polarization? Define it. Describe it for us today. What, how, how embedded is it? Do you, would you agree with Verlin's definition, maybe offer a different definition or some different layers to it? Yeah, I think I, just, I would add some layers. I definitely agree with what, what Verlin's saying about um, kind of this myth of, of spectrums, right, the, the poles. Uh, and I think that's true on various levels, and it's been, um, uh, so it's a valid, important thing to think about when we're thinking about trying to solve these issues of, of our politics. I think the, the, the layer I would highlight is how much polarization is is a social phenomenon, right? I think <clears throat> excuse me, I think we can even see, for instance, on the news what's going on in Washington, D.C., and think, oh, that's just the Washington corruption or something. You know, I think something that that's, that's not really something that touches me. I see I don't like it, but it, it is just this distant thing, right? Faceless, distant thing. Now, having said that, there is something to that thing. To that kind of thought process, right? The way the way we fundraise, the way we uh, reward um, uh, elected officials, and and those kind of in the in the uh, election kind of apparatus, there is something to that. But when it comes down to polarization, we move oftentimes in politics with our social group, and you, that may not be immediate, but over time it is true. For example, um, Utah, in uh, when uh, former President Trump ran the first time as a candidate, was one of the kind of higher resisting states. Now, eventually, you know, he still won. But there was enough of a phenomenon of that that you had reporters coming to Utah. And in fact, at Southern, we help, we help uh, show some of these reporters around trying to figure out what is it about Utah. And there's a few other areas of the country that are Republican areas, red, red states that are resistant to uh, kind of what Donald Trump stands for or stood for at the time. And uh, but then fast forward to today. And he gains uh, high, high levels of support, certainly much higher than back then. And now maybe there's some, some political dynamics of, you know, he won an election and people tend to rally around uh, the winner. But that actually highlights how it's a social phenomenon, right? You rally with your social group. And so when your social group is moving in a polarized direction, whether it's being more, more kind of uh, extreme in, in, the, in the rhetoric um, being more more attacking of the other side is, is just as as Verlin said, being all completely wrong. 
that influences us. If it's our friends and it's our neighbors and it's the person that we used to go to college with and those kinds of dynamics. And it's really, really, really hard to just simply resist that. And I may, I say this and emphasize this because the implication of it is even if we're not the one on the TV screen, uh, screaming and shouting or on, on X, I guess, formerly known as Twitter, uh, uh, you know, bashing people, we're being influenced by that. We're being pulled in those directions. And if we're not conscious of that, it is almost impossible to not be part of the problem and to try to be part of the solution. Um, because frankly, you won't even recognize that you're potentially part of the problem um, or that the ways you're behaving might become part of the problem. And so I think that the social phenomenon of, of polarization is, is really critical. And that I know we'll get into this later, but it leads to, to actual possible solutions to it. And so, but it's, but it's about first understanding how polarization kind of pulls us based on just our social crowds. You know, if you're a member of a party, political party, you're going to move with your party. Um, uh, in most, most cases, uh, certainly you can leave your party and that does happen. But, uh, the, the larger majority of cases is you move with that group. I, I want to try to kind of extrapolate some, some arguments on this idea of polarization being kind of a myth. And, and if, if I could try to read minds for folks in the audience or anyone watching on the live stream or maybe watching this video later, if they hear the argument of, okay, well, th this idea of polarization isn't really a thing, could there, assuming the response might be something, oh, come on, you just look at any issue. And, and Representative um, Curtis mentioned immigration as one of those. Any issue that feels contentious today that is not getting solved. And if, if your average voter were to say, okay, if you line up all the Republican ele elected officials and all the Democratic elected officials, they're all saying the same thing about the issue within the respective camps. If I guess I want to ask both of you is how widespread do you think that perception is? And is that part of the reason why maybe folks would perceive, yeah, there is sort of this unifying philosophy of each side that leads to this polarization because I see it on cable news every day. Are they wrong to then think, well, yes, of course, polarization is real. Of course, we're polarized as a country. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Uh Great question. So yeah, think about what Pre Representative Curtis was talking about immigration. So let's say um, you want uh, stricter um, immigration policies. You want less immigration coming into the United States. You want to build a border wall on the southern border with Mexico. Okay. So there might be arguments in favor of that or against that. I'd be interested to hear the arguments and let's have a debate. Let's have a discussion of that particular granular issue. And I think we could in itself have a have a very good conversation about that but now think if we throw in this left right spectrum and that's the way we think about politics now all of a sudden if someone is in more in favor of more restrictive immigration policy we're telling them if you take that position you also have to think that the 2020 election was stolen you also have to be pro-life on abortion policy you also have to think that climate change is not real you also have to be against military aid to Ukraine. You also have to be against free trade. What do all those things have to do with each other? Absolutely nothing philosophically, but for reasons of socialization and tribalism, those issue positions go together. So you're absolutely right. You can go to all, you know, 200 and whatever members, Republican members in the House of Representatives, and they would give you all of those issue positions in lockstep. Isn't that amazing? that all of them have all the same positions on all of those issues, that's really interesting. What's causing that, right? There were times in our history where that was not the case. We had political parties that people understood were coalitions of individuals and groups who worked together for the purpose of achieving certain common ends that they had. And they recognized that they're not going to agree with everyone in their party about every single issue. And that's okay because they're not deluding themselves into this idea that there's a philosophy that's good and true and intelligent that all of their issue positions flow out of and everyone in the party has to have the same issue positions and everyone in the other party has an evil and benighted philosophy that determines all of their issue positions and they have to be wrong about everything right so that creates this world where of course i don't want to work with someone on the other side of the aisle they're wrong about everything right so representative curtis was talking about how we can't get anything done in dc exactly the mental framework that we have causes people to not want to work with people from the other side of the aisle. It causes people to not, to not, why would you want to moderate or compromise? If you're correct about everything because of a philosophy, then you should go to the extreme on every single issue position possible because 
if it's a good philosophy, then why don't I just be extremely good with my philosophy, right? Rather than saying, yeah, I understand my party is a bundle of issue positions. Some things I like, some things I don't like, and I'm happy to work with someone on the other side of the aisle. I'm happy to criticize my own team. Representative Curtis was talking about that. People are unwilling to criticize members of their own party, and they will always criticize members of the other party, no matter what they do. No, let's just be honest. You know, okay, I, I, I think this person has bad character, but I appreciated their issue position on that. That's okay, right? That's fine. We can criticize people on our own team. We can compliment people on the other team if we get out of this uh, false left-right framework. Yeah, the, so in, in answering the last question, I mentioned that things like, um, you know, how we, how we get elected, raise funding, and, and politics does matter. And this is, I think, an area where this becomes relevant. So you taking the example of immigration, if you speak to people who uh, either have in the recent past or are currently interacting regularly with elected members of Congress, members of the U.S. Senate, and they're talking about immigration, they're aware of uh, what, what the conversation dialogue is there, they'll tell you um, that 90, 95% of, of members of Congress know what needs to happen and agree on what needs to happen when it comes to the issue of immigration. They'll never say that in public. And they'll never act that way when, when they're on camera in the halls of Congress. And that's because, in part, you have organizations, advocacy groups, uh, folks who get involved uh, heavily in elections, who make an entire living, have an entire industry, and raise a ton of money around pushing, um, uh, pushing a, a, a viewpoint and a gender perspective that keeps people away from that that common sense solution that we all know we have to have on immigration. And if members of Congress start to veer too closely to that, they get threats. You're going to get primary. We're going to run this person against you. We're going to give them a boatload of money to go after you. And there's legitimate instances of, of, of lots of them actually of members of Congress being defeated that way. And so they have actually, members of Congress actually have a reasonable uh, kind of belief, you know, that, that, that they will lose their office if they do that kind of thing. So, so you have, again, and it comes down to things like the reason why this exists is because if anybody's ever gotten a, uh, you know, a fundraising email from oftentimes from a campaign, but uh, oftentimes also from activist groups, it has a very, very uh, either angry or kind of emotion driving tone to it that is designed to get you riled up and to feel better by giving some money to a cause uh, or you know, it plays out in other ways. It's not just about money. Sometimes it's about clicking on a link and reading this article or looking at this news story. This happens in the, in the news media as well, oftentimes. And, and it's conditioning people, right? And, uh, and so it's, it's effective. And there's been studies on how, how people raise money. It's, it's proven to work. And so, so campaigns, organizations turn to this. And then to, to kind of follow that through, they, they go to the halls of Congress and, again, kind of, uh, keep the members in their place, as it were, as uh, as they they think they should be, and and so this is where all of the the kind of uh, the way we do polit business of politics, maybe to say it, uh, reinforces the polarization that we see on TV. Even though when you get people in a room without a camera on, oftentimes even on the most contentious issues out there, not necessarily everyone, but a lot of them, they'll come to agreement and be like, yeah, no, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do that, and then it, when they leave the room. You don't ever say that. You don't ever do it uh, because you'll get in trouble if you do as, as an elected official. I, I want to ask one more question about kind of the the negatives of this or the horrors of this and then pivot into some solutions and try and leave our audience with, with some positives, some optimism of essentially convince people, yes, there's a way out of this. But but kind of that last question on on the harms and, and maybe for purposes of this question, if we frame it as contempt to borrow a term that arthur brooks uses a lot in our politics that we feel so much contempt for one another which might be a, a better term in your view verlin than just the the polarization angle so to go and, and essentially persuade voters that hey the contempt you feel towards a voter or an elected official that you perceive as being on the other side so to speak on, on the wrong team <clears throat> is how can we convince them that not only is this probably not a good way to approach politics, but that's affecting a lot of other areas of your life in unhealthy ways. Essentially help folks see that this contempt or this hostility I hold in my heart towards somebody who voted the quote unquote wrong way in the last election. That's not good for me. It's not good for them. And it's probably not good for 
winning more people over to my argument. Any any quick words on how can we convince folks that that sort of contemptuous approach is not healthy for themselves and their lives, and of course not healthy for our politics? Maybe I'll jump, jump in first on this one. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it just comes down to honest self-reflection, you know? So so the, the thing you just described of contempt for another another person or another group of people, yeah, if you're honest with yourself, you realize that you're not really happy when you're that way, you know, when you're thinking about those things. And uh, you ask people what they want in their life. They want to be happy, right? Um, now, even if it's not just about personal happiness, uh, a lot of people have experienced the loss of important relationships to them because of politics. Uh, you know, there's obviously the kind of stereotype of, you know, gets uncomfortable to talk about politics and family and things like that. But but that's been taken to extreme levels, you know, to the point where some people can't even be in the same room with each other anymore uh, in the same family or in a community or those kinds of things. And again, if you actually look at yourself honestly in the mirror, or maybe what has to happen uh, to, to follow the kind of the addict analogy, someone who loves you has to come and hold up a mirror to you uh, and, and help you be honest with yourself. You recognize that's not not a place you want to be, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that's not helping you. It's not helping your family. Certainly, it's not good for your community. And it doesn't create the kind of neighborhoods and the kind of societies that we want to be in. Again, going back to the example of of uh, uh, when uh, then candidate Trump was kind of rising, um, one one uh, reporter in particular, uh, a man by the name of Tim Carney, uh, came to Utah and uh, and he went to several other places trying to figure out what was the commonality among the areas that seemed more resistant to Donald Trump, and. What he came to the conclusion of in his news writing and eventually wrote a book about it was the tight and, and help tightness, I guess, if that's a word, <laughs> the healthiness of their communities and their institutions. So in other words, they had these kinds of neighborhoods, these kinds of organizations that we all actually want for ourselves and our children when you think about it. And the stuff we're talking about just destroys that, right? It just blows it up. Um, and you see this in in things like um, for instance, there's been recent news reporting on why people are leaving churches and how politics in a lot of instances is driving people away from churches because the the pastor um, shares something that they don't like and they, they think that that political point is more important than what we typically think the church is around for, for theology and for, for other kinds of reasons. And that's just, again, one example of how the, the, the polarization at play is just dissolving all of the connections and institutions that make us the kinds of people we want to be in the communities we, we want to live in. And so, again, it comes back to just recognizing those realities. And part of, I think, how we how we do this, I've been talking a lot on this, so I'll pass the mic in just a second, is I think it's what, what organizations like, like Sutherland, like the Center for Constitutional Studies, like the Herbert Institute here today, that's, you know, when we're at our best, when we're doing what, what we should be doing, that's part of what we're here to do is help think about these things, think deeply about these things, communicate about these issues to people. And so um, maybe that, you know, I think that's hopefully part of the solution uh, is is uh, uh, people who are doing that, whether it's us or others, um, being willing to speak out on that kind of thing and communicate that kind of thing to people. Verlin, how do we convince voters it's in their own self-interest to reject this contempt and then pivot towards solutions? Yeah, I think the, the language of contempt is a much more accurate um, as you say, with what uh, Dr. Brooks talks about, uh, than polarization, because that's exactly what's going on. We have groups of people who um, who hate each other, despise each other, who think the other side is lost and um, irredeemable. And I think once we get to that point, then we're in real danger as a country of breaking up. We do have people who want to secede from this union because they say, if my political team is not in power, if I if my preferred presidential candidate doesn't win, then I better leave. Because it's not just, oh, well, I disagree with a few things or several things with that other party. It's not they're wrong about everything and they're going to use the power that is constantly increasing, unfortunately, in the national government and in the presidency to shove their policy down my throat. So in that um, instance, secession would be the rational um, approach if you think about politics uh, in terms of that, that left, right. So I do think we need to, to change the way we think about politics so that we can overcome this contempt that we have for each other. It's just so, it breaks my heart to see what's happening in families, what's happening in workplaces, what's happening in neighborhoods, 
where we have people who um, just despise each other, have contempt for each other, uh, and cannot uh, seem to to even talk in the same way. I mean, you, you give a great example. So many things that I wanted to echo that Derek said. You know, it's interesting how because people's politics has become the most important identity for them, it's determined everything else. It determines what neighborhoods they will live in. It determines what church they go to. It determines what school they send their kids to because politics has become this all-encompassing ideological identification for people. I mean, it's crazy to think that we have churches that call themselves progressive churches and conservative churches, right? They're using the language from politics. That's what's more important to them, not the theology of their religion, but they're importing this language from politics to describe their religious faith. I think that's a tremendous, um, a tremendous loss for, for our churches in America. And to Derek's point, as people move towards these um, political identities and away from their religious or other community identi- identities, then they're going to seek for salvation uh, in their political team. And then they're going to look toward their presidential candidate to fundamentally transform the country or to be the one that is going to make America great again or whatever else. And that's what they put all their hopes in. And it becomes a kind of um, cult-like uh, operation with these with these political parties. So I think that's real tragic, the way that we have to think about politics. Um, if this is the last thing I'm going to say, I'll try and end on a optimistic note. Well, we should have a little time, Okay, so, yeah. all right. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to be negative for a little, I would, I would keep with the negativism, and then I'll try and end on an optimistic note. Yeah. But, but, but we do want to shift to kind of the solutions discussion now, and and I want to pinpoint something you both said, and I wonder if Verlin, you mentioned that political identity is becoming such a strong core identity for so many American voters that that it's something that influences where they live, where they work, their neighborhoods, their friends, their relationships, and and so I I, I want to ask both of you. Would one potential solution be to sort of encourage voters, encourage citizens, take account of your own life and ask yourself real questions as far as, okay, when when I'm on my deathbed, am I going to look back and say, man, I'm really glad I stuck it to that guy on Twitter who was wrong on issue X, you know, or are you going to think, well, d- did I have the family life I wanted, kind of the the life of faith I wanted? So, so I wonder if some of these other identities, whether it's um, some kind of belief in a higher power and a higher purpose, um, whether it's family, whether it's neighborhoods or your work. Is that one of the solutions? It's not even political to tell voters, go and, and build up your connection to some of these other identities that, that are or at least should be kind of apolitical, strengthen those first and then see how that affects the way you approach politics. Is that maybe one of the solutions? I think it definitely is. And, uh, but I do think we can't get to that point until we change the way we think about politics. And so I'll just give an example. Um, a religious figure who I, ha- who I happen to really admire, probably some of you here as well, is a man by the name of Russell Nelson. And he gave a talk about a year ago saying that um, our identity is one of the most important things that will determine our success and happiness in life. Who do we identify as? What is our identity? And he went through and listed some of the identities that were most important to him and that he thinks should be important to others. And they're the kinds of things that you were just talking about. My identity as a father, as a husband, as a community member, right? And he says, and I agree with him on this, don't let other labels get in the way of those most important identities. And here's some labels that he talked about, political labels, right? If, if you start using political labels like left and right, people will assume things about you that are going to be inaccurate. And you're going to assume things about other people that are going to be inaccurate. And you're going to start treating people with contempt in ways that you shouldn't because you're going to, again, think, well, I'm right about everything. I have this you know, sense of false omniscience and they're wrong about everything, not just about politics, but about everything because politics is now pervading <laughs> everything in our lives. So I do think we should take stock of, at the end of our lives, what really matters. And I think making the the best kinds of decisions that are going to end up giving us happiness in life are going to be choosing the correct identities and shedding the less important or even harmful labels that society might want to push upon us. Yeah. And I, I would agree with the, you know, this line of thinking that, uh, you know, emphasizing some of these other identities is important. I think, you know, I mean, one way to, to, to look at it is just what you're talking about, what, and, and, and this is recognizing who we really are as people. Whether you pull the answer to that question 
when each of us come into this world, we're not political first, right? We're a member of a family first. And then as we grow, maybe we become a friend or a neighbor uh, before before politics ever really reaches us. Uh, but the way our politics is working is to say, toss that all out. No, you're political first, foremost, and always. And then everything else should align with that. So, I mean, if you really want to take a philosophical perspective, you can say, well, it's just kind of against nature, you know, kind of the way the way things are, are designed to work. And so to the extent that, that that can help reorder things, I think it's, it is valuable. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, again, being more of a social phenomenon, uh, I think to really, to really find the solution that's going to have to happen within the context of groups. Um, and it's maybe starts at the individual level, but then branches out to all those groups that you're a part of, you know, family, friendship, neighborhood, community, church. Um, and that's really, I think, where that kind of thing can take hold and start to change things. So I, I want to touch on on a, maybe how to apply this to policy disagreements. So so let's say if, if, if you're talking to voters and they say, okay, great, Merlin and Derek, I did what you what you suggested. I took stock of my life and I increased my faith commitment and my, my role as, as a member of a family, as a member of community, all these other things. I've done all that and I, and I feel less angry, but I'm still a little angry because, you know, a, a given issue is something that I feel like we're, we're just getting wrong on this country and I, and I want to articulate my point. And, and I, I want to kind of test a hypothesis with both of you and see if, if you think this, this would help to, to kind of defray some of these really intense vitriolic debates. And a recent issue that's garnered, garnered a lot of debate is the issue of student loan forgiveness for folks who have who have completed um, higher education degrees. Of course, relevant here at a university campus with, with folks in that environment uh, going to school right now. And in the course of this national debate over the last year or so, um, there, were, there was a, a paper put out by the Texas Public Policy Foundation that went through and the first large chunk of their paper said, look, we're gonna steel man the, the administration's argument in favor of loan forgiveness. The, the conclusion of the paper was, we don't think it's a good idea for a number of reasons, but first, we're going to be very thorough and give the steel man argument. And then we're going to articulate why we think it's flawed and why we think our argument is better. It seems like s most of the time in our political or policy debates, everyone is attacking the straw man argument of the other side. And so I wonder, is this hypothesis, if more voters got in the habit of, well, before I go out and argue my side, I'm going to do my best to try and give the steel man version of the argument for the side to disagree with, and then back it up with, well, here's where I think it's wrong, and here's, here's where I think that this argument actually is more compelling. When it comes to specific policy disagreements, is that something you think would help to alleviate some of this contempt, maybe help voters to you know, f feel a little bit more empathy and understanding for folks who might have a different view on the issue? Or is that too in the weeds? Is there something else that voters ought to be doing when they find themselves in the middle of these debates on various important policy issues? Yeah, I think that's great. I think there's two things that I really liked about what you said there. First, they looked at a particular policy. They didn't assume that the position on this particular policy is philosophically related to Right, so what your stance on student loan forgiveness is is somehow philosophically related to your stance on abortion or gun control or the Iraq war. Right? These things are obviously totally unrelated. They're just different issues. So that's the first thing I think they did correct. The second thing that I absolutely commend is look at both sides of the issue and not straw man uh, the other side, but say, here, what's the best argument for this position on one side of it? And what's the best argument for this other position on the other side of it. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, in his comments, Representative Curtis said, beyond um, looking at I issues on a case-by-case -case basis and looking at the different arguments on both sides, in our news consumption, we should look at both sides, right? So I think he gave a good example. Read both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Read both the Washington Post and the Washington Times. Um, or if you don't have time to read that many newspapers, find a good aggregator um, that will provide the, the best arguments on both sides of every issue. I'll just take a minute here to do a plug for a couple that I think are good in case anyone's interested. Isaac Saul runs a newsletter called Tangle. He does this. He says, here's what this side is saying on an issue. Here's what the other side is saying on this issue. And he doesn't straw man. He gives the best arguments on both sides. I'll give another one. Real Clear Politics is an aggregator 
that goes through the newspapers every morning and says, here's the issues that all the newspapers are talking about. And it gives a link to, the, you know, here's what the New York Times is saying about it. Here's what the Wall Street Journal is saying about it on every single issue. So highly recommend uh, taking that approach. Now, again, I don't think anyone's going to change their news consumption habits just by me getting up here and saying it's good for you. It's like me coming up and say, eat your spinach, right? No one's going to change it unless they change the way they think about it. And I think once you throw out the left-right spectrum, then you realize, oh, of course, I want to hear arguments on both sides. If you think about politics in terms of this mythical left-right spectrum, then your incentive is not to, because your incentive is to say, well, I know I'm already right. My side is already correct about everything. So why would I even want to hear arguments from someone who I know is wrong? Why would I want to hear something that I know ahead of time is false? But once you throw out the left-right spectrum, you might say, yeah, my party might be right about this, but my party might be wrong about it. I'd be interested to hear what the other party is saying. I'm not going to switch parties necessarily. I might, I might not, but I, I know that my party doesn't have omniscience, that I'm not correct about everything. And I think once you change the way you think, then it opens you up to, yeah, let's hear the arguments on both sides. Yeah, I, I do think it would help and uh, to, to do this kind of investigation of, of uh, all sides of an argument. And in, inherently, I think it's because um, uh, by its nature, polarization or contempt is uh, for other people based on politics is lazy, right? It's really easy to look at someone who disagrees with you and then just say, oh, they're corrupt or they're, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I mean, I mean, think about, you know, for those of you who have had or do have uh, teenagers, right? <laughs> they are very good at caricaturing what their parents are trying to do to them to then reject what their parents are <laughs> trying to ask them to do. And uh, uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort. Um, and I, the reason I pull out teenagers is to say, like, it's, it's simple, it's straightforward, it's easy to, 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 to do. And whereas what we're talking about here requires a lot of effort and requires work. And so because of that, it inherently is going to push against becoming polarized uh, or becoming contemptuous. And uh, one of the ways that, that, will, that will work out, uh, in my experience, is you start to learn about uh, people who disagree with you in ways that you didn't expect. You know, you start to see something that just makes sense or you start to see something that uh, is reflected in in your community in ways that you didn't realize and all of a sudden that faceless you know stupid evil whatever it is person or whatever that disagrees with you that you've dreamed up in your mind um to have contempt for starts to get real and starts to be a little little more complicated a little more nuanced and different than um maybe what you saw in the fundraising email or uh on, on the, the campaign ad or on social media and and when those conflicts happen it is very hard to simply remain in that polarized position because people don't want to be conflicted that way. And that may take some time, but but that's maybe the beginning. And so putting in this effort to to learn about other people's views, um, I think starts that process. Can I just add something there quick? Yeah, so I really liked what Derek was saying there. And I think the student loan forgiveness uh, example that you gave is a good one and interesting uh, because I think it illustrates how the labels that the left-right spectrum relies upon are false. And uh, so you think about how people who call themselves progressive, they'll say, well, I'm a progressive because all of my issue positions pursue the essence of social justice. So all 832 issue positions I have promote social justice. That's the one thing. And conservatives, the essence of being a conservative is they're against social justice and all of their issue positions go against social justice. Now, you could concoct a story post hoc, just like an astrologer would do, to describe why whatever evidence I present to you, well, this presents, promotes social justice and that other uh, position promotes social justice. But of course, we could just as easily flip it around, right? So right now, I think is in Team Blue that's in favor of student loan forgiveness and Team Red is against it. Well, yeah, Team Blue can spin a story by saying why student loan forgiveness is in favor of social justice, but so could Team Red, right? And if you look at the data, whose student loans are being forgiven, it tends to be people who come from money, right? First generation college students, working class people attend college at a much lower rate, uh, right? Than people who have generational wealth uh, and who have other sources of wealth to rely upon. So in some ways, student loan forgiveness could be perceived as a bailout for the rich, right? So you can, you can spin this any other way you want. And I just think that shows kind of the silliness of these post hoc stories that we tell to try and fit every single party issue position into these um, 
these uh, left-right categories. So we have a few minutes for questions. And if I can ask Dan from our team, we'll switch mics up here just so he can walk around um, with a microphone or do we have one back there working? Okay. And so anyone who has a question for our panelists, uh, be thinking that, just go ahead and raise your hand and Dan will come over to you with a microphone. While he's grabbing that, I'll ask for kind of the, the 15 second answer um, from each of you. You mentioned earlier the role of think tanks, the role of universities. What should voters and folks in the audience know and and who should they follow so obviously that we know we can plug our various organizations but just your very brief answer what what do people need to remember about the role of institutions like policy think tanks universities groups within universities that can help alleviate some of this and maybe focus more on the policy discussions you ready to take that question first yeah, so again, I just am so grateful for the Herbert Institute, for the Center for Constitutional Studies, for the Sutherland Institute. These are academic institutions at their best. Now, as someone who spent um, decades on college campuses, I will just tell you, a lot of places don't get it right. A lot of universities, uh, in fact, I would say the vast majority of social science and humanities departments and colleges um, are in the business of ideological axe grinding. They've been captured by one particular um, ideology that calls itself progressivism, and they just push out uh, ideological axe grinding in their teaching and in their scholarship. That's not what we do at the Center for Constitutional Studies. That's not what the Herbert Institute does. That's not what Sutherland Institute does. They say, we're open to a diversity of viewpoints. We're interested in different arguments and different ideas, and we want to have an open discussion. So I am, for one, uh, very concerned about what's going on in college campuses, how we have shout downs, how we have canceling of speakers who don't fit the orthodoxy. I think it's a huge problem in our country. Uh, but I am given hope when I come across academic institutes um, like Sutherland, like Herbert, like CCS, that are doing it the right way. And I, I hope that continues and spreads to more and more places across the country. Well, then and take my answer a little different direction, but um, I just got to mention this stuff earlier, but uh, I think within institutions um, and more generally, one important thing to, to kind of recognize about the solution to this is that a lot of it's going to come down to relationships, either within your institutions or within uh, outside those. Um, so, I mean, the takeaway, yes, like, you know, what, what might be the takeaway for voters? Go out and find somebody who thinks differently than you politically or philosophically and get to know them on a regular level not like a oh yeah i talk to them every six months when i see them in the store but like you interact with them on a regular basis whether that's daily weekly something like that the more you get to know that person i promise you the less polarized you will be <laughs> because again you start to actually get to know someone on a real level and you recognize you start to recognize through conversation and dialogue how you probably share the same values in a lot of different ways you probably have same priorities in your life in a lot of different ways um, maybe your politics are different, but when that's the dynamic, then you can just agree to disagree because you know, the person when, when we sort ourselves into kind of, you know, uh, homogeneic, uh, or homogeneous kind of, kind of groups, um, in, in various kind of, uh, measures of homogeneity, then, then those people who are different than us are actually a threat, right? There's something outside, something foreign, something uh, aliens, you know, it's, it's, they're not real people anymore. Um, and until you may, may establish some of those relationships, that's how it will be. And that is an, an environment that cultivates and just, uh, makes the contempt thrive. And it just completely breaks down when you go to the effort of interacting with someone different than you within an institution or outside of that institution. And, uh, it'll, it'll enrich your life personally. I can just say that, but beyond that, it'll actually help solve some of these problems that we face. Default. All right. Question. So, a uh, side so gentleman with his hand up here. Hi, thanks. This has been terrific. I appreciate uh, the conversation, the pop problem of polarization. James Madison might call it the problem of faction, right? Is one that's important. And I'm pleased and thankful that uh, groups like the Lynn Institute are carrying on that conversation. I think it's very important. One thing I, I kind of do worry about, and I think Representative Curtis mentioned it, is in not everything is polarized right they do have these uh, examples of bipartisan legislation and so forth passed in washington but what the concern i have sometimes is the 
House representatives and other legislators kind of open up the public treasury and say, well, if you'll support my position, we will, per- you know, we will purchase basically your position by funding this in your district or funding that and or, um, you know, otherwise going, you know, going into debt on the credit card to say this is this is how we're going to achieve this bipartisan result, creating what I think is sort of an illusion, you know, of bipartisanship. They haven't really solved the, the polarization problem. They've kind of just purchased it, basically. Even the last debt limit uh, increase uh, lays out a path for, you know, 18 or 19 trillion dollars more debt. Uh, and the way they purchase the debt limit increases to create more debt. Anyway, my question, I guess, is on that very topic. How do we, how do we um, avoid opening the public treasury to, cr- to kind of create this illusion of bipartisanship or to uh, gloss over or put a veneer over this polarization? And how do we really tackle it rather than pay for it? Well, a couple, a couple of thoughts. Um, first, I, I really appreciate how you brought up uh, Madison because uh, one thing to recognize that I think is actually a source of comfort on this stuff is while while the expressions of the problems we're talking about today maybe have some uniqueness to today because of things like social media that didn't exist in the past, there are problems that have existed forever in our system. You know, um, extreme rhetorical attacks on people, you know, and things like that. I can go back to the you know the differences between the, the the John Adams camp and the Thomas Jefferson camp when they were competing for president, or uh, attacks on Abraham Lincoln, and we don't hold a candle to a lot of that stuff today. Um, in any case, this is something that's existed for forever. It's kind of inherent part of our system, it seems. Um, but then more specifically too, how do you not open the public treasury? Uh, uh, that, that's a very tough question because part of that is the business of getting, getting political compromises done, right? You may have to, uh, come and, uh, what accommodate another person's position. And if that position is, you know, I would like this thing funded over here, uh, cause I think this is really important for my community or the country. Um, I think they've, they've tried to establish some good rules around that in terms of things like being transparent about it, that I think is, is helpful. And so uh, I guess uh, what I'm coming to saying is I think maybe the best thing we can do is make sure that stuff doesn't happen kind of, you know, underneath the table so that at least voters and others can recognize what's happening, see what's happening. And if they don't like that, then, then they can elect different people, you know? Um, but compromises and and the funding of different priorities that's going to happen through compromise i think is kind of a part of our system but it can be limited right we can we, we don't have to just say well we can't do anything about it i think it's a matter of putting proper limits and bounds on it yeah i am also greatly uh, concerned about the national debt i'm greatly concerned about national government spending uh when you're talking about debt in the 30 plus trillion dollar range i mean it's it's really frightening and i think that could be I think that's one of the biggest national security risks that this country faces and what this could happen, uh, cause for us financially. Uh, so the historian side of me says, well, if we're going to find hope, can we look back and find times in American history where we have cut government spending as a percentage of GDP, when we have cut government deficits, when we have balanced the budget and, and what happened then? And I think, um, just as an aside, two of the mo- biggest, um, misperceptions of the argument I've been making today, and I, that's my fault because I'm not a great communicator are one people think that I'm against um, political parties or a two-party system I'm not against a two-party system I'm simply against the delusion that these parties are philosophically coherent Uh, and the second uh, thing that people will often say is well you don't think people can be philosophical I don't believe that I do believe people can be philosophical I just don't think those philosophies are left and right so let's go back to the 1990s when we did cut government spending when we did balance the budget how did we do it we did it with divided government and we did it with philosophically principled people that says, my, my principles come before my tribe and I have a philosophical reason for wanting to cut government spending. And we did it with a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. That was great. As voters, I think we should be terrified of unified government. People typically say, well, I'm so worried about the other party coming into power. If it's unified, yeah, you should be worried. But you should also be worried if it's your party. Because whether it's Democrat or Republican, whenever they have unified control of government, spending goes up dramatically. The debt goes up exponentially. So divided government, I think, is our best hope to get uh, Congress and President to work together to philosophically, for principled reasons, cut government spending. At least that's how it happened last time. 
So we're, we're a little bit over time, so we'll, we'll have to call it there. If anyone else had a burning question that they wanted for the panelists, come up and, and chat as, as we conclude the event. But thank you all again so much for being here. Thanks to UVU and the Center for Constitutional Studies, and thanks to the folks watching online uh, for this edition of the Sutherland Congressional Series. We also want to remind you we'll be sending out an email to anyone on our event list with a QR code for a survey to give your feedback on this event. We'd love to welcome that to help improve future events. So thanks to our panelists, Derek and Verlin. Let's give them a round of applause.